Hello, folks, and welcome to the Historical Fencing Guild's weekly live stream. I'm Nick Tucker, and I'll be your host, uh, narrator, and altogether annoyance while we get through it. Um, at, I try to get on a little early to give folks a chance to get in and on, but the Historical Fencing Guild is brought to you by The Simple Sword by Nicholas Tucker, available through Amazon. In the past weeks, we've actually been going through a lot of concepts on this. We've skipped a few, and I want to get back to that, at least until the commentary drives us along. Now, for those of you who don't know, my part of the vagaries of Indiana, where corn and rednecks are summoned, and uh, the coyotes howl in unison, is hot. Really hot. And the library where I work is not air conditioned until the start of shift, so it takes a while. So I'm a mildly cooked version of your usual host. Let's see. We're going to crack open the big old book here. And please, if you're watching this, hit that like button that should be at the top of your screen or somewhere so that YouTube knows that people care about what I'm doing. We've skipped a few things, and I was told, asked to get back into it. As soon as the heat breaks, I'll film the uh, the Sword and Cloak demo, and I'll throw that up at leisure. And for those who are still in contact, I um, I will be taking messages as always, both through face uh, through, I'm sorry, through Facebook Messenger and the the YouTube chat. Thank you for the like, folks. Fire away. Let me know who I'm talking to. We got folks coming in. Um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, teaching, okay? Because the way I teach is a little bit different than most people in my field. And my approach mirrors my philosophy. Ah, uh, hello. We have the lovely Ren Contessa. Firing up, I, she, she uh, did something for me over this last week, and I'm eternally grateful. She, she's very knowledgeable in certain esoteric things, and it's it was both enlightening and downright reflect, refreshing, if I could speak, around my lack of caffeine. I'm sorry, I came home and just kind of zonked, so I have to make up for lost time. It really was my pleasure as well. We'll, we'll see. I, I hope you end up doing something else with that. But one of my my biggest, and it's actually right here. We're gonna uh, to, to people who are working out of the book. I am working in pack up. Uh, oh, part seven teaching techniques. And uh, the first part of it is if you're going to teach. I'm sorry, I am in my socks, and they do not have enough resistance to let me stay put. So I'm slowly sliding around the room. This will make for an interesting live stream, but I don't think anybody's going to mind. Um, oh, let's see. We have a comment on Messenger. And no, I am not currently on the radio. Um, I am on this live stream, and I'm notorious for stalking the live streams of one Brian K. Morris who's a wonderful publisher, writer, and friend, and everyone should follow. But, uh, great, and thank you, thank you, thank you for your, your tolerance. Um, we will, uh, sorry, getting back into it, the first thing when you're going to teach is please, 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 don't start teaching till you know the material. Now, this is something I've encountered a lot. And it's part of a two-phase of uh, a type of applied ignorance that happens around martial arts, uh, certain uh, other activities that, that either have violent connotations or um, things that, that require more finesse than maybe we appreciate. What I mean is, a lot of people, they get one lesson under their belt and they start thinking they know what, what they're doing. And they start wanting, and, and it's great to want to teach, but you can't teach something 
with you can, you can share what you're learning, but you can't be in that role of correction because you can give bad habits. You can uh, give uh, you can mistake instruction. I'm sorry, and you have to you have to know the material inside and out, upside and down. You just need to know it. Now, part of that is also understanding you can't be ignorant of your student. And this is part of where how I approach Western martial arts versus a great many people do. Um, a great many people approach Western martial arts, and uh, one of my first instructors certainly did, and they approach uh, the teaching of anything like this as automatically assuming that the student knows nothing. And I, there are two ways of approaching this. You can teach with the, this is the one true way. We're going to go X, Y. This is the only way. This is how we learn. That is not how I'm about. My little flag fell down. So that evil, evil little, there's an evil little spotlight. I swear I could film in pitch black and you guys could see it without that little flag up there. Ah, But, as I was saying, they, they assume this is the only way you do it my way. That is not my approach, especially to dealing with new students. So part of it is you have to review, and you have to be able to analyze your students' capacities and their, uh, their interests, obviously, because if you're not teaching them something they want to learn, they won't pay attention. Um. So, you have to look at that. You have to understand their attitude. Okay, let's that their attitude. How are they approaching? Are they excited? Are they the kind of person like, put me in, coach? I want a sword fight. Let's go, 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 go. You know, fire up, fire up, fire up. Or are they the kind of person who's hanging in the back, shy? It's, you know, maybe not a tra traditional quote unquote martial arts student. You know. I work with a lot of people who other groups, in my opinion, failed. They neglected them. I'm going to pull this camera down just a touch because I see it seems to be dr either I'm drifting downward. I'm already short enough as is, but or <laughs> wow, I'm all over the place today. I require more caffeine. One of these days, I'm going to get Wally World to plug me for all the. Uh, not lightning, I drink on camera, but you have to analyze their interest and their attitude. Because if they come in with a snotty attitude, you got it's better to say, look, we're having a personal difference here. It's not that I don't want to teach you, but if you don't want to learn, I'm not going to waste my time. And that sounds arrogant. But I've known people who either have lied about their background, and we're going to get to background a bit, saying they know far, you know, they pretend to know less than they do as a way of testing you, which I kind of respect. I think you should ask questions to evaluate anybody instructing you, but do so respectfully, at least in the beginning, because you should be able to learn from most people. But there are also people who, uh, we had a guy. I'm going to tell this story, and I should get into it, but this is a good story. I'm not going to use his name, but everybody refers to him who knows as effing at his name. We'll say Asterix. Asterix, Asterix the Nameless, uh, came to me when I was working when I was the president of the uh, PNCSCA. That means I was running a branch between a liaison office between the greater SCA group at large and the PNC uh, medieval club. And, and, and he told me all these stories about uh, things he had done in that group and uh, all these styles he knew. And there was a problem or two with it because when someone studies martial arts, unless they're the kind of person who switches it on and off, which is there, 
they tend to be uh, fairly aware of their surroundings. Um, any martial art, any of your Eastern martial arts, any of your Western martial arts, any of your your Native American martial arts, they have those, by the way. Anyway, uh, any of them, one of the first things they teach you is a way of, uh, of centering yourself, of knowing I am here spatially. My arm's going to reach out, you know, so far. And my hands, as soon as I do it, my hand cramps, and I realize I don't want to gesture wrong in these days. But, oh, I can reach out. And if something's right here, which should be about the edge of the screen, I can reach out and poke, and I'm going to be at about the edge of the screen every time. But that means I'm less likely to bump, you know, theoretically anyway. So people who, who practice a lot of martial arts uh, tend to have a good sense of where they are in a room, where, where they are relative to people. This is something you should be watching as an instructor and as a student. Your, your, your uh, instructors should be able to usually navigate a room, which sounds silly, but... I, I have some theories on klutziness, and usually it's not being able to center and pay attention to what you're doing. Once in a while, there's an inner ear thing, or, you know, you have a leg shorter than the other. But all that can be uh, dominated. All that can be dominated. Dominated street. No. Uh, geez. Bad joke, Nick. Bad, bad joke. Accent. Okay. Sorry. I'm in a mood. You will be, too. Anyhow. They're, they're, they're going to move with a certain proficiency and an economy of motion. And Asterix had none of that. He wild through rooms and bumped into things. And it proceeded to tell me that he was a black belt in two or three cells, that he'd, been, he'd studied at certain events and done different things. And it didn't mesh. And I will always remember... Moved... <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes. This is a solution looking for problems sometimes, and it just fits my mood right now. Wow, I'm really just... Here we go, folks. We're going serial killer loadout, apparently, because I found my beloved butcher knife trainer. And I have... I love the feel of this, even though it is a cruddy trainer, and I can't recommend it. But this is still one of my favorites just for practice because it moves, feels, and handles like an axe. Anyhow, distraction, 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 distraction. So Asterix is the kind of guy who walks into the And I beat me, I'm like, do you know, you know, you know this, yes. And I, you know this, yes. And you've studied, and he's talked about some rather esoteric forms of Tai Chi, some rather esoteric, and there's a, a, an underline there. So I asked him, so you've studied Nenpo. And he went, yes. Okay, so you've mastered Nempo. Yes. Nempo, as reference, you Because know, I, I was very careful. Single stick, Nempo. Or, I mean, I don't want, not Kenpo, not, you know, Nempo. Yes. That is a fictional martial art from the movie Demon City Shinjuku, where you use your chi to level take cans and cut them with wooden swords from many feet away. And I am like, oh my, I've got one of those. But he was civil enough I could work with him, mostly. Now, I will never forget Asterix taking a fighting sense. <laughs> Even complete with the, yeah, I'll give you a hint. As fencers. And at the time, that's what I was teaching. Renaissance fencing. Giganti based, where I love to live personally. Yeah! I have a sword. Ha ha! I can't do it. No, no, okay. Whoa, let's just pull it down. And I take a Whoop. Very. And if you've seen me fight, you know I am not an aggressive fighter. I'm not an aggressive person most of the time. And I threw my shot, and the blade comes out nice and slow. 
and I watched him, and I don't have enough room to fully, because his stance went from here to here to pull the leg up. He actually took a standing fetal position stance. I squeaked, and I'm like, okay. So now we worked through, and I just learned, ignored the BS. What was coming out of his mouth was, and that's it was just ego, and asterisks, and I almost got asterisks decently fighting before he moved on. But my point with the story of asterisks is, in part, he he thought he needed to lie about his background. And that's simply not true. Now, it was coupled with a unique form of arrogance where he, uh, upon fighting one of my instructors, he managed to land a very deliberate open shot. Because I'm going to tell you something. You may notice, when when you are teaching a new person, or, or you are a new person, the teacher's moving slower. The motions are bigger. The openings are more obvious. That's how you teach. When you are a teacher, you should be getting hit a lot. What I mean is you tell them, okay, do X, Y, and Z. Okay? And during the introductory phase, you... You leave the opening so that they can learn to see these openings, okay? So if I'm teaching somebody just the basics, when I'm first teaching, if you you watch the videos, you'll find my, my side parries are very wide, you know? My motion is very deliberate, very consistent early on. Now, as they get more confident, just like a DM playing D&D &D and your, the monster's levels right or something, you raise your level up slowly to match just about what you want is always to be a bit of a challenge presenting new material, but one that can be overcome with effort. And when they can consistently do that, you'd go up the next step. And this is how you build confidence and you build competence. Not, there are two schools that I find horribly offensive. First one. Titles should not be for sale. What do I mean by titles? Ranks in any organization should not be pre-arranged for sale things. In you know, growing up, I have met some veterans. I met and, and through college, I met some devastating martial artists. I've had some real pleasure, high you know, mid to high belted individuals that I got to play with. I am a no belt. I don't, I'm not a part of any school, so I'm the guy in, in sweatpants and a comfy shirt going, okay, let's play patty cake. What can I learn? That's always been my approach. I like being the fat guy at the buffet of martial arts. I will take a few bits from boxing. I will take a few bits from, from assorted uh, Western things. This is how I operate. Is it consistent? No. Is it how I work? Yes. I walk the path of the fool so that in hopes someday I can consider myself wise. And I try to present from the, the from the fool's view. Think, think like the fool. Think like the basis. And as soon as you think you really know what you're talking about, stop and rise. That's when you know nothing and start over. But you do have to have an understanding to teach. Now, the other form of ignorance I find, especially for people who are trying to teach too early. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't know what you're doing. Let me tell you how that works. There was a concept that got bandied around. It was new to you, not new to the game. What does that mean as I prattle on? What it means is, if you do not wish to look like a donkey, 
You hear, hear that rumble as I say that? A donkey. You gotta get a little Shrek on there. Because there are people who are like, Hi, I'm so-and-so. Hi, I'm, I'm Nick. Nice to meet you. I No, no, no. This is fencing. That's not heavy. I, I, I'm, I'm starting a story without giving you the lead up. I've been away from the groups for a while, and I went to a practice. And it was back when I was very active in multiple situations. The guild was really taking off, so I was playing with LARPies. I was playing with some, some, some strip fencers and doing other things. Still trying to balance and liaise between them and uh, the SCA that was local in my area and a few other groups. But I've been neglecting the SCA for political reasons, etc., and I went back to see how things were going and visit some old friends. And this woman walks up to me, says, I'm so-and-so, and this is that, and this is... And, and starts... Holds up... This is a rapier. And we do this, and she was trying to instruct, one, without being a fighter, and two, without figuring me out first. So after she told me what which end of the rapier was supposed to be used, because obviously... I didn't know. I had to reintroduce myself, complete with titles I no longer use. The whole applied bona fides. This caused great discern discernation and settled things down. But make sure you know who you're talking to. And make sure... <laughs> Very few people come into any art, especially a martial art, as a void. They are very, very rarely do you have a blank slate. Now, many schools and many approaches are you find somebody, you hammer out anything that doesn't fit, and then you mass produce them. Chunk, 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 chunk. This is great for building an army. This is not great for building individuals. And it might shock many, if not all of you, to believe. I believe in the philosophy of the individual. So, what, where, where can you find people who are going to be beneficial? Who you would think? Well, let me look at my list. You have dancers, uh, marching band, you know, players, undervalued asset. If you want somebody who can keep one foot in front of the other and have devastating footwork, get somebody in marching band. And other martial artists. Because it is something to, to, to be playing with somebody and have them go, oh, by the way, whop. Why? Well, that's what I do in a hop keto. That's, you know, this is the, you know, you, you're, you're doing something, you see them do something else, and it's like, Okay, what do you play? Come on, out with it. Oh, I've done some Screamer. Aha, Screamer. We can work with that. Don't hit them with the stick, but you can stop the sword. Let's make the stick go. And that's part of it. Find what they have and weave it into what they learn. Again, the other thing is we got to talk about something. And I know I'm rambling really bad this week. I, I hope you guys are putting up with it. But I have this thing about physical limitations. And as you can hear, it starts like way down and rattles up. My first instructor was a Ponce. I learned a lot from him in spite of him. But he was a Ponce. Just... I'm try, I try to keep my, my swearing down, and I have a, a capacity to swear that, that is elaborate. But this guy was a pot. And he only wanted the people who fit the style. The tall, slim, athletic, usually men. Once in a while, women, because he wanted to have that whole thing. But very often... You know, do, do, do. anybody else, uh, teach him enough for them to lose and run them off. They're a waste of his time. Well, when I first started working, I was in charge of the wastes of time. 
That literally was my gig. You know what? I'm going to take the people. Hey, we look at me. Take the people who actually have a chance of being in, of any value. They're going to come with me for personal training. You deal with the others. See what you can do. Okay, dude. Go. <laughs> right piece. Let's do this. And I worked with people. And I worked with people with physical limitations. And I wrote it down. I think it's beautiful. It is my firmest and unwavering belief that a person who had full men who had full mental faculties can learn to fence in one format or another, regardless of physical limitation. What does that mean? That means if you are mentally cognizantly aware of your situation and you are willing to try, attitude is everything. Anyone should be able to, to learn some means of fencing or swordplay or whatever to even a limited level, either as practical defense or simply as an athletic action, preferably both, because I don't believe in learning multiple systems. Wait, Nick, you just said you were a fat guy at the buffet of martial arts. I am. But, as I accidentally dropped myself, I am also, I was doing that to sample. I, when I was learning, I would sample, and I still do. Mm, do I like this better? So I know when I come to the meal that is about, I have certain aspects that are going to be on my plate. I'm going to have that low main of basic knowledge and understanding of timing and martial. So I'm going to have the orange chicken uh, of good offhand parry work, you know? We keep a stout beef and broccoli of defense and, and, and tactical awareness. I'm going to build the meal so that I can enjoy it and I get out of it what I want. Odd paradigms, but that's okay. I'm a chunky monkey. I'm not, I'm going to own that. But once you know what you want, you want achieve, once you've achieved direction, seek consistency. Um, be able to do the same thing over and over. One of my favorite quotes is attributed to Bruce Lee, and if he didn't say it, he should have. I don't fear the man who knows 10,000 kicks. I fear the man who does one kick 10,000 times. That is my approach, folks. Find what your thing is and just do it. Whoo, my hand's passed, but I caught it anyway. Um, I'm, I'm passionate right now, and, and I'm excited, and I'm playing with this happy little knife trainer because it's one of my favorites. And that's what happens when you get something in your hand. You start you start to play, and it's nice, and it, it, it's really cute, but uh, I got to put it down so I can talk. I'm talking too much with my hands and not enough with my mouth. Getting all the way back. Figure out your, your, your student's physical needs. Tailor a style to that. That means if they are athletic and dynamic, um, my buddy Al, boom, hey man, how you doing, let's go, this man needs shorter, aside from, you know, his given uh, foil and epee and saber, the man's a three-weapon fighter, but he does things with foil, beautiful, it's very, let's go, pop, 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 pop. you know, it's very fast, he needs that style weapon, a single, darting, active energetic weapon. Then I take my buddy Jim. Jim isn't going to do that. He has leg problems. Jim's going to wait till you goof up and he's going to bring it down and just smite you. So what do we do? Give Jim a shield. This was a mistake. A delightful mistake. But it was tailored. Mid-range style. Give him a screamer so that he, you know, 
He got screaming. He, his flow is better than mine in that field. I love it. That's what I want to see. Now I take somebody like the beloved Ren Contessa. When we were playing light weapon, dance-based movements, flow. Guile, deception, and then devastation. It fit her personality. You take somebody like Trelena, her fight is very different. You know, she's got her uh, tortoise shell, very raptor stance. It's there. It's a, it's a unique and beautiful way of fighting. And apparently, I'm my bopping this bopping the camera. That's okay. The point is, look at the student's background. Now, I, if I get to the book, what does it say? It's a little drier. Obviously, it's a written book. It's not me bouncing off the walls of your camera. You have to know about their experience, martial arts, ROGC, gymnastics. Another good one. Uh, marching band, I can't talk about. I want to talk about martial artists. Because martial artists, especially those with some actual skill and experience, are a quandary for a lot of uh, trainers, especially newer trainers, because they might know their style more than you know yours. And that's true, but you know your style more than they do currently. So what happens is you're not teaching them like you would teach somebody who's never held a sword, somebody who's never taken a stance, never had a physical conflict be it you know something as benign as sparring or as unpleasant as self-defense. You got the language is there. These people you don't approach with a hard curriculum. You you respect the opinion you see. How does this work for you? Okay, that works for you. This is how I do it. And what you end up in to me, is the highest form of practice. My all-time favorite kind of practice is either the delightful one taking somebody who doesn't think they can do it and building them up, and I see them start to get it. Oh, that's that's cake and ice cream. But there's also this where, where um, Sword Sage, Sword Sage on you, YouTube, Marco and I go way back. We would have these practices where it would be three steps. Dude, I got a new style. Awesome. And he would usually demonstrate the, the kata for it, whatever pretty swirly stuff. Okay. Now he's like, okay, try it on me. You know, respect, tap outs, all that stuff. You know? And let him, uh, then it would be, okay, now I'm going to resist. And I have the advantage because I knew what he was trying to do. But he needed that to test it because that's the hardest. The absolute hardest thing to fight is somebody who knows how you're going to fight. So you practice. And then you end up with the, the, the mixed styles. And that's when it gets beautiful. When you get one, one person doing a hybrid of, you know, Tai Chi Jin with you know some Bagua, a little bit of Wing Chun uh, hand working thrown up depending on the weapons we switch through. My goofy butt going Gigante for life, you know, throw a little Fiore in there, a little Fabris, dance some Thibble through. Good times. You're like, Nick, you never say Grandpa. No, I don't say Grandpa. Don't usually talk. Capo Fera or Capo Wera. It's just funny. My speech impediment gets a hold of those two things. And that brings me to other, other projects. But um, while we're fighting, I learn about him. He learns about me. I start to pick up little things. This is great. Um, John Miner was great for that. You know, aside from getting to spar against somebody who's like a, nearly two feet taller than you, broader with a reach almost as long as you're tall, that's you can't buy that great of life experience, folks. 
Um, in the early days, it looked like a male version of Arya fighting the mountain, I believe is how to put that in Game of Thrones. I have not seen the series. I've only seen cut clip scenes largely because uh, the whole water dance thing got set my way. I don't know why. I used to be poofy hair, but now I'm all streamlined. But, um... Uh, huh. You need when you're when you are looking, you have to adapt to their attitude. Do they think they can do it? If if they lack enough force of ego, enough personal, you have to. It's it's a little fire. You have to toke, stoke. You have to add tinder. You have to build a fire up. That means you know, being very comfortable with compliments. Very careful with application and, and being very comfortable with potentially a very long, slow arc of education. That's how you teach somebody like that. If you have somebody who's eager and they're competent, you just kind of ride the wave. Okay. And if you have somebody who has too much ego and maybe they don't listen or they don't want to be safe, sometimes you have to make your skills known. It's a very, this is a very, uh, touchy thing because many people do it too often where they uh, they want to overassert themselves I have to prove I am the teacher and I am better than you ha I don't aim for that once in a while I have to assert myself to say I am competent and I need to be respected safely not with injury if you're good, you should be able to accomplish this. But sometimes you have to. What I will say, and I hate, my least favorite teaching style is the guy who does this. I'm going to kill you. Okay, you give me. Lay on, and you die. Okay. Lay on! And you're dead again. Re repeat it nozzle. Because that's the theory. If I keep hitting you, you'll eventually get it. It might shock you that some people will walk, not see, especially as a new student, how to avoid that shot unless you teach them. That's why you're instructing. And if you are the kind of person who's like, ha, bam, didn't block it, huh? Ha, bam. It, block it, huh? Huh, bam. You watch me, I try. Once in a while, it slips. If I kill somebody three times with the same way, same basic technique, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to be like, whoa, we're going to stop. Step it back, step back a notch. Where we go from, you know, low to mid-speed sparring, much slower. We're going to talk about this, and then we're going to do it. I am killing you the same way. I, you know, you have a gap in your guard, or I can bait you. Whatever's happening, I can reasonably and reliably recreate it. Then I tell you what I did, and we work as a team to figure out how will it be best for you to get past this to not let it happen. And there are a lot of ways, different techniques for different situations and different people. But it has to be a conversation. And this is why all my students speak very similar on concepts as a rule, but fight sometimes radically different. Because most of them are built radically different. And finding, my goal isn't to teach you, teach you to fight like me. Because one... I'm overweight, short, I have messed up legs. My goal, my goal is to train you to be able to beat me, first and foremost. Because if I can teach you to reliably beat me, and you didn't know how when he started, and if you come in, it's like, you know, I, I'm Donnie Yen, you're going to own me across the field. You know, Ray Park, own me. I have some beef with uh, Darth Maul's original uh, choreography, but that's a long story that doesn't get in here. But, 
Yo, that being said, I would spar with Ray Park any day, even though he don't me. That'd be like, that's like bucket list stuff. But you, you learn. You learn what you can. And you discuss it. And you build your own stuff. I... If I were to write another book that encompassed everything, I'd be tempted to call it Finding Your Fight because that's what I try to teach. You need to find your fight, not my fight. I will give you a Rosetta Stone of basics. Everybody I know who I train with, everybody who comes on my to the guild practices, who's read my book, who's really worked at it, has a base a base mental vocal and physical vocabulary they understand thinking about I should parry to the outside to the point where you no longer think about it, you just do it they understand talking I need to parry to the outside to block away from my center line that sort of comes in that sort of goes away and they understand the physicality. That it's three stages, but they all have that as a conversation. So then they can go to another style. It can be radically different. Uh, Jim is a screamer, is or where you can go. Okay, that's that stick's going to come in sixth and cut down by my style. I get that. So whatever they call it in that, they know they can come to me, yeah, I bring the stick down in six, and pop, pop. No, six, seventh. Anyway. <sighs> Guys, I'm rusty enough. I'm starting to flip my own numbers. You, We got to get this, this coronavirus thing. Powers that be, please, it's time. Let's get this viral outbreak done so I can go back to doing what I do. And before somebody says, Nick, you're, you're trying to lose weight while you're drinking full-fat pop, blood sugar's tanked right before this lovely little uh, video, so I know I need to take care of it. This is a uh, black cherry and water like I usually drink. And hold on, I'll show you. My lovely... Imagine your story. I got this at the library. There are benefits to being a librarian. But, uh, and because I need to carry a beverage at work that's not going to spill. So, this is very awesome. You should support your local libraries. I do. Okay, back to it. That is going to be the key. Now, we can take a step to the sections. We can talk about attitude, and we have quite a bit. Balancing how much you build somebody up versus kind of, I don't want to say tear down, but people get ideas that aren't accurate. Now, if somebody is that good, there is nothing wrong with saying, wow, okay, you are really talented, and your experience is higher than this, that, and the others. But if I've established a repertoire, if, if we can talk, I'm sorry, my speech impediment is acting up really bad. If we can talk, if we can converse, we can get into the whole, but you're leaving yourself open. There have been times where I've had to instruct somebody, and they're, you know, six foot six, big, burly dude. It's like, I'll not, you know, at the library, I had to pull a step stool, stand up, take your guard. What? Just take your guard. Now do it. Pop. You're open up here. Oh, because they don't fight people their height often. That's that's what what you need as a uh, as a as a teacher to understand, and as as a student to seek out. Um. Whew, well, sorry. This room is kind of cut for the air conditioning, so I'm a little, little warm right now. Oh, that's a concept I need to talk about. I need to talk about something, too, while we're talking about analyzing students 
and um, you know, people. There is a certain trust between a sword master or a truck or whatever and their student. And that term, you know, it's a pseudo historical term, but I really like it. It's a, it's, it conceptualizes it. It's the sovereignty of the soleil. The what to the what what? In, in the act of training someone, the instructor is in charge. They are the dominant person in that conversation. Now, as always, I my, my, my approach will always try to keep as level as possible, but essentially with veto power. This is important historically because, think about this. The ruling class, okay, had to learn self-defense. Every prince, theoretically, every lordling, every princess had to learn something from somebody. That somebody was usually some type of uh, martial arts instructor. Uh, they, you know, they, they doubled as the captain of the guard, perhaps. It would be someone who was knowledgeable and would train other people. So what would happen is when they stepped environment it was like a country in, in and of itself this is a tremendous trust because for that system to work two threads have to be maintained the, the student must trust that the instructor will not use that situation to harm or influence them and the uh, instructor has to feel safe in the knowledge that the student, who once he goes out and puts back on his pointy hat, won't hold offense at the physicality, the unpleasantness. Because I'm going to tell you something. This is a real truth, guys. No matter how careful you are, no matter how good the gear if you train in a martial art of any kind, there will be pain. And I just, you know, viewership drops. What? Pain? No, I mean, accidents will, there will always be a potential for accidents. There will always be a potential for injury. There will always be discomfort, both in the physical of, ow, I got poked in the arm. Oh, oh, even if it's a foil, you get poked enough, it starts to get sore. Muscle soreness as you teach muscle memory. There will be pain. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But it should never even hint to slip to abuse. And I have had instructors who did. Physical punishment should not be the response for any disagreement of the field. That is a failure of the, the sacredness, at least to me, and this is getting philosophical here, and that's okay too, of the uh, uh, of the Soleil, uh, of the sovereignty of the Soleil. Soleil is a term for fencing school. If I'm going to teach somebody to be better. You know, let, let me put it this way. Modern equivalent of a fencing school would be private firearms instruction. You know, MMA is part of it, but also I'm going to teach you, you know, not, I'm not me, but the instructor is going to teach you how to operate a firearm or is going to teach you how to throw a punch, a kick, how to how to take a punch, how to take a kick, what that feels like in a safe environment so that should you, it, when you encounter that in an unsafe environment, you know what it means. Because it's funny, I, uh, 
I am a failed pacifist. I've always, I have been for a very long time. And I still have delusions of a world where my skill sets in many categories are never needed. And that would be a per- both my greatest fear of being useless and my greatest hope for the world is that I would never be needed. That's complex. But what I am good at in these aspects involves a measure of violence. And I despise violence. I hate it. Because it is never one way. I don't care what anybody says. If you do harm to someone or something, you do harm to yourself. That may, maybe not as severe, maybe not, but there's a damage there. There's a karma there. And if somebody does harm to you, especially if you're not versed in the, the mental equivalent, now, I know many people who've never been in a physical altercation. They are both, uh, I, I, I both on a level envy them, their uh, innocence. At the same time, I fear for them. Because the first time you are struck in hatred, or you're, and I don't mean just like, uh, People playing, you know, you know, school schoolyard fight, usual, you know, bam, bam, bam. I don't like you. You don't like me. Pow, pow, pow. No, I'm talking to somebody really trying to do you harm, and you see it, you feel it, you feel the ramifications. It saps you. That's part of why I teach applied cowardice. I don't. I would rather have you escape and not have to deal with that, if at all possible. And this is, again, this is the practicality, but we have to realize I'm not going to teach you a system that if somebody came at you and you had to defend yourself with a stick, you couldn't, would it probably function? Nothing's 100%. And I don't, I don't make heroes and I don't make masters. I've never claimed that. I teach people um, the basics. I teach people the elementary to middle school level of these these arts so that they can then find out which ones they like. It's, it's as much finding out about what works for you as what you work at and what you're interested in. So with classical fencing, a lot of it for a long time was watching the way people move and go, okay, hey, have you considered reading Meyer? Ooh, ooh, you, you like that forward stance. You get low and in. Look at Fiore. You know? Oh, Giganti. My man, Giganti, we're laid back. I'm not going to lean and let you poke me in the head. That's ridiculous. You come here. And then move you on. And then hopefully, if I do it right, you come back like, I learned this awesome stuff. Let's go. And then we can spar playfully. There isn't a lot of ego in it, because the only real opponent that matters in the sparring circle, in the uh, in the world of training, is you need to be better. Like that, I look at the man in the mirror, and I'm like, am I, you know, am I beating the me that would sit on the couch and play video games instead of train? And if I am, I'm doing better. You test among your friends, and you should learn. Like, wow, if I fight this person, they're going to do this. And I've had groups. Sorry, I loosened my flag again. I've had groups where you fight somebody, they just devastate you. And there are a lot of people who want that role. They want to, to always be the superior fighter. And sometimes they are. You will meet people who are just better and badder than you. You know, there is always a bigger fish, folks. But if 
if you learn from it, even if you never beat them, but it makes you better than you were, you have profited. And maybe more than if you just dominate them, if you just do, 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 with the win. The lesson is there. Um, and that's valuable. At least I think so. Um, I'm get, Like I said, I'm starting to get into the more philo philosophical side of things. But it's important. And there is, you know, whatever your system, I believe there is a debt. There is a karmic system in place in that a balance. And if I teach somebody how to wield a weapon, I am introducing a quantity of violence into their lives. And I realize that. Now, sometimes, at least in my sake, the enemy I fought with, with you know, this, the people I fought were just proxies. Every opponent Every person who held, you know, this blade clanged against and any of the others I own. I used them to fight the anger, the the the, the demons of my own failures, the <laughs> metaphorical and literal. Uh, it became an extension to build the confidence to fight the fear. And that's part of what I try to teach. I'm not... I'm not so far as to say the healing sword, but I think there's an aspect of that. Where when you have had your confidence taken from you through uh, trauma, through situations, abuse, depression, when the parts of you that start to dwindle we have to fight out sometimes. And that process can generate a tremendous amount of rage. Now there are two ways of dealing with it. You can do a style or an approach that is a direct channel outlet of that rage. It is the taking a pell and going full speed with a training stick and just bah, 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 bah. and you're beating it till you're sweaty and your hands are blistered and you're rage and you're screaming and the fury of all whatever's inside can just burst out like a supernova. That's important. But that doesn't, I find, always treat it. Because there's always more. And you can't just always explode because the rage wants to. In fact, most of the time, you can't. And you shouldn't. One of the hardest things is to break a violent cycle. To receive pain and not seek to kick, pass it out onto others. What I learned through fencing is classical fencing. This you know, my bailiwick here. Very different than, than my katana studies. Very different than my splitting ball and more practical things. Staff gets different anyway. But I learned to control. To take that boiling rage and condense it and focus it and control it instead of it controlling me. And by doing that, I didn't just take back the power from the people who did harm onto me. Because they're, they're, they're out there. There are people right now who in the past have tried to kill me. Quite literally. I am aware of that. And part of my faith and part of my philosophy is to try... It's to try to forgive, if possible, but I am not divine enough to forget, if mechanically able. So, 
what does that mean? Like, where, where am I going with this? I'm way off book. It means that there's a price. And part of it is to teach not just how to fight, but why. And even in, you know, your, your thing might be, I go out, you know, uh, spirit gum on some elf ears and become, you know, Eller drawer the elven knight. Wah, 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 and you swirl swords around and you have fun. And that burns off the stress of real world. It's great. Do it. it might be, I want a tourney. And maybe, maybe you're, you're actually an MMA guy, you know, I mean, hardcore, bah, 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 bah. and you, 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 you channel your strength, your fury into strength, and you test it to see where your strength is, you know, and yeah, I know it starts to sound very Dragon Ball, you know, my power is more powerful than your power, but that's an expression, and the people who are, are driven to that usually have a reason But if I'm going to teach you and take the time to teach you how to make a knife, how to select a knife to purchase, how to use a knife, how to use a sword, how to select a sword, how to make a sword, I'm going to teach how not to and teach why. Because a lot of people don't know why they're doing it. And fun is valid. There is nothing wrong with sheer enjoyment of the coolness. As long as that permeates. Because if you're having fun, you're not actively trying to hurt people. Most fairly mentally sound people. I mean, yeah, you can have the odd psychopath, whatever. But those are far fewer than, than people want to admit. But you can learn from it. And see, I I enjoy marksmanship. I used to do a lot of air rifle, a lot of archery, a lot of other things. And I enjoy sword work. And why do I philosophically train sword work in a world of guns? I get that a lot. Well, the answer to the problem is gun. Usually prefaced Glock. Putting my opinions on Glocks aside for a moment. <laughs> the the gun is the way. You can't. In function, a gun is a simpler concept than a sword. You can't defend. You can. You can imply offense to prevent someone from getting hurt. But it's very hard to physically stop an attack with a gun. It does one thing, it does it really, really well. And I, you know, I was raised by a man who would show me the holes left over. The gun puts a hole in somebody with a hot, ugly piece of lead. That's how I was raised. I'm not anti-gun at all, but I respect them for what they are. The tools sure as a wrench is a tool for doing something. But spiritually, and I do believe it, I, I'm getting into the parts that make this me, and again, I've only got one viewer, maybe two right now. That's okay. I can... I can defend. That's why I usually carry a stick instead of a sword. I can do harm with a stick if I am required to. But it's much, much, it's much, much easier to not be fatal. This is why historically the police carried clubs, not swords. Because a policeman's job was not, and is not, to kill the populace. They are not judge, jury, and executioner. 
there are times where it's necessary, sure. But where it's necessary is very different than, than being a primary orientation, the, the go-to idea. I will always see real-world violence as a tremendous failure. And it's not, not a popular opinion. It's, it's philosophical, but it does need to be discussed, especially in this day and age. Um, if you're going to engage in this, you're going to find it haunts you. I have had to defend myself and been totally morally just in doing so. Uh, limitations applied. And I still have nightmares about it because the part of me that's there doesn't like it. Doesn't like that I've had to apply pain for necessity. It's why when it comes to hand to hand, some people make fun of me because I was trained in, in something called a uh, crisis prevention and intervention CPI. Also lovingly called hug foo in certain, certain circles because it's for dealing with uh, physical and mental, physically and mentally handicapped people essentially who uh, intend to harm you how to control them in such a way they aren't hurt, you aren't hurt, and everything can be de-escalated. And de-escalation should always be key. Maybe that's not what you expected to hear on a historical fencing guild uh, channel. Might even cost me subscribers. But it's the truth. And I'm going to tell the truth as long as I have a voice. Well, we are getting into the second hour, and we're actually a chunk into it. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm, well, I'm not sorry, but I kind of went places you probably didn't expect. We'll, um, we'll be a little more on par for the second hour. I need to stop and thank my sponsors, uh, my patron, uh, Steve Agosto, shout out to you as every week. Thank you, sir. You're, you're keeping me afloat. Uh, thank you to the many generous uh, donations of Nemo Smith, my former, one of my former, and to the alternate, den uh, <laughs> the alternate systems of support provided by the lovely Ren Contessa and the ever unique uh, Steve Clausen over at, uh, I believe it's Class 3 Firearms. Amongst other titles, I try to give you guys a plug out. You're you're uh, you're good people, but uh, so if you want to support, please, I could really use your know, patrons right now. Even a dollar a month would make a big difference in keeping me able to afford to buy gear and training equipment while we slug through waiting to get the world rolling again. And if you like what I'm talking about and you like sword play, again, please consider my book, The Simple Sword. Uh, it's available on Amazon, and it is still free, because I'm kind of goofy, through uh, Kindle Unlimited. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me see. Let me see. Questions from the uh, gallery. Um, boom. Yes, uh, I am doing okay. I'm sorry if I seemed a little, uh, little sedate today. Part of me is tired and part of me is just emotionally tired by the uh, goings on. Questions. Uh, what is the? Oh, I got a good question. Okay, here. What is the smallest uh, acceptable, that, you know, viable defensive tool? What do you mean by that? I, 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 you know, message me. Sorry. Okay. I don't have a set of knuckle dusters here. Knuckle dusters, brass knuckles. Uh, reinforcers that go around your hand keep you from breaking your uh, fists, your fists, these things, your, your fingers, when you punch things. 
These are viable. A heavy ring I have seen used to great effect. Actually, if you look, there is a faint line right here. I'm sorry. My, I'm getting camera. It's like I've lost both my eyebrows, but uh, <laughs> at one point or another, fr from uh, a spiked ring that I took to the eyebrow because I'm an idiot and I couldn't think of any other way to block my fr my uh, friend from getting uh, rabbit punched in the back of the head with said spiked ring. So I just sort of leaned in and took the hit. Dumb, dumb, but it worked for Wallen. That being said. My Little Buckler, as originally made by Dennis Yakis. This is about for fencing as small as I would elect to go. It's about the diameter give-take of my open hand. I can still provide surprisingly good control, and it works rather well. Off camera for a second. Sorry, guys. Oops. Okay. With a more open guard. I can use this to close very very early techniques involved using a buckler as a handguard, essentially, to stop attacks, I, independent or combined. Combined closes the middle road, which we've talked about many times. I would not go much smaller than this. Um, practically mobile, large, how large would you go? Um... I've seen wall shields, not shield walls, wall shields, as in rolled out portable walls that are used freestanding in a tournament, etc., to forcibly gain uh, battlefield control. Oh, that's a good itch. Uh, that being said, I would stick to something roughly two and a half, three feet in diameter. A round shield would be usually the biggest you can go bigger with a round you can go smaller you know teardrops are very effective if you know how to use them uh heaters can be effective i'm still a big fan of just you know if i'm gonna go for out and shield i kind of like a round uh, a rotella style domed round shield a little bigger than what captain america likes to lean to for people who don't know but yeah, think think real close in terms to the saucer slut. I mean, you wouldn't think. Pardon the dust. I've been doing other things. That the difference between the cold steel buckler and this guy, which are, are, are almost exactly the, the outer ring, would be substantial. But when presented at the what I consider the sweet angle for a shield, which is that little forty-five. Like this. Why do I like this? Because if I can get it parked about here, any shot that comes in is going to hit this sort of UFO shape. You know, Ed Wood would have loved these guys, but, and it's going to deflect off. And it's not going to deflect into my shoulder if I keep my angles right. So presented here. This is actually present, almost covering all the way to my elbow by the cone of defense. Now I can flip it out. And block a lot more. You guys remember the cone of defense. That will keep your shields. Usual. I was like, like I said, you think about it. How much is this going to block? Point defense, uh, macro style? Not much. I extend it. And now I can do what's called cross block. And I can actually do reasonable defense. If your wrist works and you're fond of the High five method? <laughs> no! Stop in the name of the sword, you know? You can you can use that to great effect. But unless you're looking to be able to link with a shield wall, I would uh oh. I I would uh, I would really stick to uh, using the the uh, sorry around for mobility 
Now, if you're looking for shield wall, a more rectangular is going to allow you to interconnect. You're going to be able to set up things like um, uh, you'll be able to set up things like uh, your your turtle. Essentially, you're going to be able to form a mobile fort that lets you shrug off light to medium uh, projectiles, like you know a hail of arrows or thrown stones, even uh, crocks of flammable liquid. Uh, shield. We live, when we look at the, uh, when we look at the weapons and we look at the styles, we, we don't function in a big melee as individuals. You are part of a unit. So when you have a melee group, when you have a large group of people moving, if they fan out, especially without defensive tools, unless there's a tremendous intimidation, unless they can actually kind of stare down their opponents, they're very tactically vulnerable to be overwhelmed and caught off guard. These ta the tactics of spreading out and kind of barking and growling is a very uh, hunting dog mentality. You know, <laughs> uh, it won't work when people realize that there's, you know, math-wise, there's only so many of you. Having shields, interlocking, being training to move as a single large unit with discipline and planning that's a whole nother ball game. That's why once you've reached a level of what I consider functional skill, you need to train with your friends. You need to train your group, especially if you're part of an organization. And I don't care what. Um, mo I find a lot of HEMA focuses and, and classical fencing focuses on uh, individual duels, especially, especially duels of honor, which is where our sport fencing pretty much comes from. Uh, the, the melee tactics, however, are uh, very different. And this is the, you know, how the military works. You have to realize when you're looking at it from that, you're, you've gone from defense to warfare. Now, yeah, a hair, Steve Clausen, welcome back. Unless the herring group is very well trained, and you need to be trained as a her, herring. Wow, my speech impediment hates that word tonight. Yes, you, as a her, herring, uh, harriers. Harriers are people who harry. A harriers easier than I could say harrying. Yeah, no, not coming out. Harriers should be trained in strike and run tactics. They flank, they hit, they do damage, and then they sh that hole should be filled by regulars, and they should be out getting into more mischief somewhere else. I was a Harrier. In fact, I was a dang fine Harrier on the light field at one point in my life. I'm old and I'm fat and I'm slow and I know things now. So, it's a different league. But, uh, I, you know, I've watched recent bouts. I've watched, you know, HEMA groups. I've watched SCA videos. I've watched LARP videos where, you know, the big battle. <laughs> Yes, there is a scrum when everything tends to fall apart. But if you're really, really dedicated and you practice, the scrum happens around you. It doesn't happen to you. And the individuals who are like, oh, I'm a bad mofo. All by myself. I got buddies way over there. Buddies way over there. You're just insects. Get out of my way will not prevail against an organized force. It just doesn't work.
So it's sort of, you know, Steve's bringing up Harriers. Harry, Harry, oh, you're going to have fun with me in this speech about it, aren't you? Tactically, if you're doing that, if that's the route you're going, you already should know the, the rules to know how to break them. Yes, a lot of what I teach is these are the rules. Once you've learned the rules, you can go, I am breaking them to do this. Same with Harriers. A good Harrier group will look like the most regimented, dedicated line guys till they stop doing that. Because that's part of how they get into position. You know, the end cap of that line is not where you think it is. It's about five guys farther back. Those last five guys are going to break and mess somebody's day up. Look at the tactics. And I think we're going to see more of that understanding as people overlap. I don't know. I'm hoping they don't. I really would love for a lot of what I know to be suddenly and pointedly less relevant. I'm really, really hoping that I was talking earlier about wanting desperately to not be needed, even though my greatest fear is being useless. Excuse me. This is one of those situations. But people need to understand the rules. And I, I don't know if they're changing or not. I hope they are. But until they do, we need to be vigilant. We need to make sure we are training to work with others. So, again, getting back, you're, if you're a LARP group, you've got an adventuring party, you better be developing some strategies, some tactics that work with what you have. You have a big guy, either he's in back doing something to reach over the little dudes, or he's in front punching the hole, you know? Um, you got little dudes. Are they two-handed little dudes? Are they walking tanks? Are they my jobs to literally just uh, impede things so the big guy can smite them? You know, the whole, what, what good is two shields? I can come in here and be like, I am a snow plow. You point me. I'm going to put my head down, put two shields up. I go, <laughs> through, and you hit everything above me. Uh, these these types of and none of those are really my role. Most of my roles are usually off to the side, like flank here, go here. Which is funny because I can do it slowly. Some of my best harrying, God, I hate that word, was done quite quite slowly because I just stopped. I was disengaged from the fight and I watched everybody else be stupid. And if you can figure out when people are being stupid, then you can engage at will. What you don't want to be is forced into doing things. If you're forced into a response, bah, 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 you're missing your opportunity. So it just, that you'll notice I bring these things full cycle, people. Know your role. Le learn the basics. Find your role. Find your fight. Apply. Train with what you have. If something goes bump in the middle of the night, and your thought is, I'm going to pull a knife out of the knife drawer. Nothing wrong with that. Especially for us na night owls who are like, hmm, some mac and cheese and tuna would be really good about 3 a.m., Rattle, rattle, thunk. Now, Steve is going to say something that ends with, you know, starts with the gut and ends with the un. You know, you know. And we're going to, you know, a Freedom Pez dispenser. And that's fine. But that's not what I'm teaching here. There are other groups who can do that. I like that warrior poet guy. He's, he's a good place to start on some of that conversation. But this... This is my chef's knife trainer. This is also a wonderful metaphor for what I say. If you carry something and you use it all the time and it's always in reach 
have a trainer version, figure out how it works, what works for you, know your reach with it, make it go. Train with people. If you have people, train with them. If you don't have people, that's okay. Train to be the best you can and find people. Good people are a tactical asset. And there is a mythos of, I am super dude. I can do it all myself. I am a one-man wrecking machine. Q, 80s like synthwave music, long hair, driving lights blinking, you know. Alone in a world of darkness. He rides. Yeah, that dude doesn't exist. Even Knight Rider had the talking car and the repair crew backing him up. You know, Rambo, M60s are great machine guns, I suppose, but they're still supposed to be a two-man crew running them because somebody's got to be ammo monkeying that stuff. <laughs> Which I know is random, but do you get my point? You need to keep, uh, keep aware, train, find what interests you and train in it. Train, try different styles. I positively hate the Meyer approach to Ponder Dagger. Or uh, Rondel Dagger. I hate these same things. Hate them! But can I make it go? Yes. Can I make it go in a period style? Probably. Could I stake an MFing vampire with the, with the right techniques? Abso-buffy-lutely. But if you don't train, if you don't try, if you don't know, you don't want to find out at that minute. If you have any doubt, disengage anyway. When in doubt, get the bleep out, okay? I say this routinely and constantly to my students. When in doubt, get out. Unless you are defending someone who cannot move, is defenseless as a small child, unless there is something of that level of irreplaceability, a living caring being, nothing is worth dying for. You say it, no job is worth dying for as a civilian. No uh, possession is worth dying for. Now, it's different. If you are in the military, if you've taken an oath to protect the Constitution from all threats, foreign and domestic, you have some obligations there. But you've also signed on the dotted line that you are getting into that fight. And you're obligated to get into the fight, to seek and engage the enemy as they appear. That's what your oath is. So that fat, gimpy people like me can... Uh, Sleep safely at night. And I am dang thankful and I'm proud of you. And we wouldn't have the 4th of July coming up without a whole bunch of people like that. And so it might not be popular to say right now, but again, it's me and I don't care. I'm going to tell the truth as I see it. I still believe in patriotism. I just don't believe in nationalism. There's a difference. But... Again, getting off topic, Steve's good at, at uh, bringing that out in me. Uh, let me look to see if we have any questions. It's been a quiet week. Must be something big going on in like an episode of sports or something. Let me see. Uh, ah, the Contessa is still on business. We have some other issues going on. And yes. Oh, um... Shout out to Terraform Comics. Look them up. My partner and an erstwhile individual, uh, Luke Stone, has branched off to form his own company. It is impressive. I'm still waiting to hear some details, but the people that are involved are really cool. And while it is off topic, let's go there. All right. Um, let's look at the commentary. Uh. 
Let's see. Oh, um, yes. You, I get this a lot. Nick, I want to buy a sword to train with. I don't know. I don't have a group. I want a good quality sword that's safe to party with. How about go? Now, as he reaches back into his field of props, this is a slightly modified Rollin Synthetic Saber. I'm sorry, Rollin Synthetic Sword. Uh, Red Dragon Armory, it's under that name too. It's the Basket Hilt. Now, the Basket Hilt is normally black, but this one got all purpleized because it's my wife's. This is an extruded nylon blade with a steel core for the bottom third, almost like a reinforced forte makes sense. It is also, boink, rather forgiving and moderately priced. Um, these guys are great. They're not, they've fallen out of uh, favor of late because of, of what I call the whites, like uh, the Penty line by Purple Heart, the, uh, a lot of South Coast swords, uh, slash Black Fencer, the Hema Swords, really popular. But these still bang for your buck for simple quality, reliability, and versatility as it is a threaded modular system so you can get different rigs. I'm still really prone on going there because it's it. Now, if you're not thrusty and you're looking for a general one-handed sword, I'm still going to pull, pull Purple Hearts uh Italian tactical trainer. I don't get kickbacks for this, even though I helped uh, with the modified design, but it's still one of the best trainers on the market. But there's no flex, so a matter of being safe. If you are looking for something more fencery, I'm going to go classic and say get yourself a practice fencing foil and rig it how you like. They can be done very inexpensive. These are some options. Uh, what else do I have offhand? When in doubt, sword simulating object. In this case, it's a 36-inch uh, uh, poplar dowel rod with uh, two table uh, chair feet in, uh, I want to say, seven-eighths. Might be three-quarter. Very comfortable to grip, whatever you're using. And then this can be fought like nearly anything. And it can be turned into nearly anything. So I really still, these guys are the cheapest option. Yours probably won't have this co a cool mermaid on the side. But if you, yours does it, you can always put a cool mermaid on the side. Cool mermaids happen. Uh, to, so you always have options. Look for versatility. Now, I will say again and again and again, because it keeps coming back to this. If you are training to uh, use a style. So, for example, live steel sword I like is my cutlass. Great sword. Works well. Does the job. Let me put that sheath down. Thanks to the amazing Steve Lawson, I have this. Now, what inherently would be the value of trading with this? Do you see? They are very similar. You want very similar train tools. This is lighter, but I'm okay with that. This is still one of my favorite swords of all time. This was given to me by John Miner. And I reference it a lot because this is something... I can use. I do believe if you're going to train in a weapon, train in a weapon system that you can use in your environment. A lot of people love their great swords and they love their long swords, but it's really, really hard to swing a great. You can't swing a broadsword when you're in the forest. The extra steel keeps getting in the way. Uh, crediting Michael Longcore for that lovely reference but um we are an hour and a half into uh video land 
It's been kind of quiet this week, which is good. We've got three likes. I appreciate the likes. Appreciate the comments. Um, I'm just double checking some things because uh, you know I want to see who who's doing what amongst my supporters and. We live, guys, we live in an era where a lot of people are trying not to tell you the truth. They, you know, it's getting spun. And I kind of don't believe in spin. So if there's something you want to know, Sword Fight Wise, you can always comment there. You can comment on my, my, uh, the YouTube comments come through. And if I don't answer them directly to you, I will answer them in ne the next week's video. Um, but, whew, I'm almost tempted to cut it short, guys. Almost. Because we're getting at the, uh, I'm an hour and a half in. And I do try to, to run it till 10. But we not getting a lot of feedback. And I've been really kind of passionate to this week. Uh, what should we talk about next week? Let's, let, let's figure that out while we decide. Because that's usually what brings people in anyway. Um. Trying to go over anything I overtly missed. I talked about baseball bats. I talked about weapons. We have a lot. We have a lot that I've covered, and I'm pretty. Oh, hmm. I suppose I could do a discussion on armoring. If if, if armoring is something you guys want discussed, hit it in the comments. Um. But other, oh, I got getting some comments right now. But uh, yes, uh, all right. It's okay. I can I can talk about that. Reverse grip knives. There are two a few things you hear about if you do channels. Swords worn on the back and reverse grip knives. Uh, there are styles where reverse grip makes a measure of sense. In some cases, sorry, I'm, I have to reach. The reverse grip, this is technically considered a reverse grip. However, it's a karambit, so it's designed for this. Let's you do things like punch past and graze and slash, impact punch, impact punch. This is a very fluid, especially if it's double-edged. It's a control device. Brutal, brutal thing. Uh, let me find my knife. That being said, reverse grip reverse grip with a uh, a single edged um, parrying you know, a single edged knife is not it, it's very good if you have a strong grapple if you are more if the knife is an accentuation of your style and you're knife trained in it, you know, you're going to be closing, doing bad things with the hands and the knees and the elbows, integrating the knife, then yeah, sure. I believe in simplicity, especially since most of what I do is geared towards novices. Knife out, 45 degree angle, here. Presented, but not excessively. Why? This gives you options. You have a lot of places you can go from where you are. All the sword blocks are still there. They're just smaller. All the stabs are still there. The blade is just smaller. You can control it. Knife fighting is an ugly, ugly thing. Especially when you're using an actual knife or a shank little dude. Shank little dude, all you could... It's just sewing machine. You're going to go. Well, oh. 
but uh, we're gonna go, and that's because it's a brutal thing. Ironically, I find the shorter the weapon, the less, uh, the more brutal its application, because it has to be because it's such short range. It has to be a uh, either a hidden deployment where it is. There is hell, and then sudden overwhelming force. That's how short weapons work. So the the idea of a reverse grip, where I'm I'm tantoing it, because if I stood up, knock something down. That's okay. You're less likely to see that the knife, the knife isn't clearly presenting. If I come in like this, you know what I'm about. If I'm here. You don't see it. Me just sidestep. Till it's there and it comes in. I that has value, but it's it's very, very it's very advanced and it's very uh I don't want to say dishonorable because in self-defense honor gets very different. But it's it depends what you're doing and what the tool is. Also, if you haven't done a lot, you're going to be uh, bigger motions. You watch people. And if you do this, the problem is most people reverse script think of the Michael Myers, Jason, Psycho Stab. Why? I, I'm sorry. People are having trouble finding the feed. And I am not sure why that is. So I'm going to have to take a second live feed to go and address this technical problem. So bear with me while I address it. We'll talk about the... Don't worry, I'm still stabbing people. Stabbing happens... So... It should come up. Sorry, we had some we had some problems. The the uh, net and I guess YouTube were interfering. Uh oh, and it just got dark outside. Cool. Reverse grip still it will never be my favorite. Can I make it go? Yeah, I can make a lot of things go. And maybe next week I need to bring some of the knife trainers up. Is that something people'd be interested in? You know, again, comment or message me direct. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. We've got some people coming in that we're having some problems. I'll even run it a little late if I need to, to keep you guys entertained. But, uh, you know what? No worries to folks having technical difficulties. Right now, a lot of things are <laughs> a lot of things are being kind of shady. So, uh, yes, yes, we are good. Uh, I am taking, still taking requests. The people missed. You might want to check. I kind of got philosophical. You might enjoy it later, or you may think it's the ramblings of an overstretched hobbit who you know had his ears lowered and isn't thinking too straight due to heat. That's possible, too. I also apparently have a drinking problem in that I can't drink and have it stay in my mouth. Eh, that's fine. Nothing nothing I'm wearing is stain issue. But, so yeah, um, there are people who are very, very good. Uh, Doug Markita being like the patron saint of reverse grip, uh, broken scissors, swirly fighting. Uh, it's not my style. But it does have value. It just isn't what I usually play. Um, for me, I think dagger. And let's go on. I think something like this, you know, or in a perfect world, they would make a double length one of these, and I would send it to Ren Contessa for her to draw with. But, you know, something like this. This is what my mind thinks 
dagger. A knife, I think something usually small like this or Bowie or, you know, and I can get those trainers. They're just not up here this week. I didn't know that was going to be a point of discussion. Uh, but, yeah, that would be my thing. Let me check my comments because I'm, I'm getting a few through. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back, Steve, I think. Welcome back, lovely Ren Contessa. Uh, you guys have been missed. I've been talking to myself for the last, oh, 45 minutes. Uh, maybe not that long. But uh, we got a message. Why did I say that about back swords? If something looks really cool in fantasy, as a rule, but wasn't done historically, you know, martial arts-wise, that being any period, you know, medieval, renaissance, whatever, if it, you know, didn't catch on, there's probably a reason. Now, humans are very interestingly designed creatures. We're much more open and, and mobile in our grip than the vast majority of creatures on Earth. I mean, you have the other primates, and then you have things like cephalopods, and that, you know, bears maybe, but they don't find them. You know, we have a great big range of motion. We do not, however reach back very far. And if I'm putting a sword on my back and I'm drawing it, I either need a custom sheath or I need like a very specific shape of sword. I don't like it. It's not comfortable. It doesn't work real well as a rule. Yes, there are limited exceptions, but they're just that, limited exceptions. Now, it gets preached by people like Shad, who respect what he does for the community, but respectfully disagree with the whole back sword thing. People forget, okay, this is my sidearm. Sword usually wasn't a primary weapon. I know that's earth shattering. A sword is a side arm most of the time. I'm going to use a mass weapon. I'm going to use a ranged weapon. I'm going to use something better than this, usually. Exceptions. Like close quarters. Cutlasses, folks. They're short, so you can swing them indoors in the dark. Why? Because that's where the fighting that wasn't on top of the boat went. Most medieval cities and then Renaissance cities that were still going were made with narrow, winding, slightly difficult to navigate streets. Why? Because it slowed an army down trying to get through. It was a defensive tactic. That means people got used to using weapons that couldn't, that had to be used in tight quarters. A back draw takes a lot of space. The other thing is weapon retention. If you speak to a police officer and you startle them, any longtime cop will do the same thing. We can try to do it. And I got a gut belly. You'll see that hip at hand. The hand goes so from the side, you see whoop, that. Now, you know, sir, what is that? What? No, no, sir. Let's, let's talk here. And they'll draw your attention to here. Why? Well, that's simple. Weapon retention. The hand is on the gun, not necessarily to draw it, although the intimidation of I could, borderline brashment, but to make sure you can't reach over and be like, you're like, hey, I got your gun. That happened in period. You're walking in a crowd. You don't want somebody to be able to pull your sword and either just be like, right, peace, I'm out, run away with it, or... Take it and poke you with it, and then run away with it. So it was parked at the hip. A lot of people wore cloaks because they don't want to get wet. You don't want your sword getting wet. And if you angle your sword blade up, 
just like how rifles oftentimes were barreled down so water didn't get down the barrel, angled here, pushing down while hung at the belt, which I don't know if I can get at. I can't get at with my current camera setup. This is a sheath, and most West Hema guys are, neglect the sheath as a concept. Let's, let's just use the sheath. Have this handy-dandy sword. Love this handy-dandy sword. It would be hung relatively loose so that I have lots of drawing options. If it rained, you do this. Why? Water then falls down. It can't pool inside the sheath and damage your blade. You can't do that with a back sword. If this is hung here and it rains, the water gets in and rusts out your sword. It can get in the fitting between the pommel and the grip, rust out your tang. This is bad news. This is practically wow. It causes your, your background tarp to attack you. I will never be a big fan of back swords. Yes, they look cool. Yes, The Witcher is a cool video game. Yes, Final Fantasy VII. Great video game. I love it, even though Cloud carries around a giant butter knife. That would weigh a ton, but hey, magic. You, you add hey, magic, and you can do pretty much whatever you want. You want to carry around an uh, um, overblown version of a horse-cutting sword? Like my man from uh, Roy E. Kenshin? Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. But real world, we are limited. The, the same limitations that make it possible to look at a, a Dow manual, a Dow cutting technique from the Han Dynasty, and look at a Polish saber technique from the 1800s, and go, wow, those cuts look familiar. Not all of them, but enough are born from the same body mechanics. I guess I'm going to be on this rant at least once a month for the rest of my string life. We all have a functioning human. Elbow only has so much range of motion. Their wrist only rotates as far. They can only draw a sword so long before it becomes impractical. Look at what worked and what's carrying on. You want to talk about hand weapons? Vahawk. Ubiquitous. Bearded axe. Tomahawk, travel hawk. You had the little spike for different applications. This thing, in one form or another, has been going for I don't know a few thousand years. Why? Maybe because the design works. What you have to look at whenever you're looking at a Western martial art or an Eastern martial art, whenever you're looking at a weapon style. You have to go, why is it still not in use? Now, it's interesting. The rapier has route roots to early, there are early Celtic swords, leaf blades, long, narrow, nice things that start to have almost a rapier flavor. What happened is armor was developed. And then our buddy, the gun, made armor obsolete. You needed mobility. You need to be able to duck. Without armor, lighter, piercing, and slashing weapons came back into play. This gets, you know, you could go all the way to why Saladin's troops carried curved swords because unarmored, a curved sword gives you many more kill opportunities than a straight sword, especially from a horseback that's one. Sabers were so popular so long as armor went away again. <sighs> What's still in use? The machete is still used. A one to two, two and a half foot long 
hacking blade that is straight or slightly curved works really well, both as a practical tool and implement and for dismembering people with speed and uh, accuracy with relatively little training needed for all you uh, despots who want to use uh, younger soldiers than we consider appropriate. Uh, it takes a while to learn how to make a sword go. Uh, axes is still popular in one format or another. Because this is a tool, I can use this to accomplish something, so it's not solely a melee weapon. I can split wood. Many of them have attachable you know, or other implements. Useful. The Spetsnaz shovel is good, yeah? Is sharp. My comrade, we, we sharpen the shovel. We, we dig hole. We kill you with shovel and bury you in hole. Is good. That's tongue-in-cheek, folks. Please don't be offended. And if you are, you know what to say. But uh, great swords fell out of practice. They're heavy. Because they are. They're cumbersome in tight quarters. Because they are. And they're too slow to do a lot of things. It's hard to sneak with a great sword. And there are going to be people who I know who can. Largely because they are so large, proportionately, that the great sword is basically a bastard sword or shorter to their uh, bodies because we have to scale our weapons eternally to the wielder. But uh, I hope that that answers that question. Fact draw just doesn't work well. Can it be made to work with elaborate rigs? Sure. Is it worth it? Nope. Did it happen historically? Perhaps. Now, some Eastern cultures, absolutely. But if we're talking uh, European, very, very, very rare, because it's hard to draw quick. Well, what'd they do? Well, again, a great sword. That. I'm going to rest. I'm going to rest the cross piece on my shoulder. And I'm just going to go, and we're going to march for a while. Because, especially, we have, we talk about armor, and we have to talk about arms. And I'm going to go late doing it, because it needs to be done. Uh, do not confuse the stylized uh, weapons and uh, the stylized uh, methods of duels with practical warfare. And certainly don't confuse them with defense. I'm going to tell you the idea. Now, Lons Connect are different sorts. That was their job. They were mercenaries. They carried their weapons. Their weapons were a sign of their... Oh. Their weapons and clothes were a sign of their value, their funds... The uh, the value that they could present ref was a reflection on their effectiveness. Very strange law. Still, not comfortable to carry one of these things. You talk about, talk to a creature called an infantryman. Anybody across any uh, military training, you want to know what they talk about? What they hate more than anything is, uh, like, the rations they uh, eat. But after the rations, after the MREs or whatever, the weight of their gear. They will curse the weight of their gear. It's heavy. The ammunition is heavy. The weapon is heavy. Historically, the sword is heavy. I have no doubt in 1300s, any European nation, there was some dude like, God, this sword. Yes, I have to fight it, but the sword is heavy. It's uncomfortable! That's why they got away from it. So, I, that beep means my cell phone came uncharged and is grumbling at me. I 
got into a lot of topics this week. It was a very rambly week. We'll try to be a little more on on par next week, I think. Uh, sorry. My whiskers are distracting me. Uh, but I've been at this for two hours, and apparently some folks lost my feed. That's okay. Uh, we we talked. Let's you know, recap. We talked a bit about. We talked a bit about looking at your students, which led to a philosophical discussion, which led to some question and answer, which I love. I love question and answer. Um, if you like the philosophical side, if you want more of that, let me know, please. If you want me to shut up and be like, Nick, we want to see sword fighting. Go cut something or, you know, do harm to some water bottles or so. Let me know. I might be able to arrange it, not for the live show because of some techno limitations, but I'm sure I could do something. Uh, yes, I know. I, I've gotten several messages about the cloak fighting discussion. Um, I'm hoping after this weekend to have the heat break and that I can uh, set up somewhere big enough to actually show you some pretty stuff because cloak fighting is pretty. I really wish I would have a sparring partner reliable, but these things happen. Uh, I want to thank Ren Tessa, as always. I want to thank the folks who messaged me questions. You know who you are. I want to thank Steve uh, Clausen. And it, we're, we're over uh, two hours, guys, which I always tell myself is my cutoff. It is almost exactly 10 o'clock local time, so I'm going to end this. And I'll probably get flack from the people who got bounced. There was some YouTube difficulty. But uh, thank you. If you like what I'm doing, please consider being a patron. Whatever you do, please like, share, and subscribe so that you don't miss any more of what all we do. Especially as things improve, I'd love to get back into the format where I'm show just sharing uh, sparring videos. I miss sparring. I'm sure you do. And we'll, we'll go from there. But uh, thank you again. And as always, support your local Swordmaster.